What channel did you say you gave us in your territory? 109? 109. I see. One freaking 09. They do zombie takeout on channel 6 of your silly hairball network, you ungrateful cretin. And welcome to Zombie Takeout, the B-Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, we have some feedback. This is actually a restatement of some feedback from last week. I just needed to bring it back. Um, Bodo on Twitter said, I hope you didn't mean a rollerball doubleheader by watching the second rollerball movie. <laughs> I'm only two minutes in and I already hate it. Um, yes, like I said, we read that last week, but... We we didn't fully understand the gravity of it last week. I don't think. Uh, well, this is uh, is this a first though that we we're we've reading done, the same thing twice or we've done sequels well, uh, the remake kind thing. of remakes, but this, we've never done remakes back to back. Like I think this. this is the first time we've done that. And I mean, whether or not this is a remake is debatable because the story no. is a little different. But we did we did both Psychos, didn't we? Did we do them back to back though? You're right, you're right, you're right, we did, we did. I think we may have even did it in the same episode. Yeah, right, we did Psycho. I forgot we did the second Psycho. Um, I mean, that was a long time ago. That was like, was that episode 50 or 100? Psycho was 50, so the remake would be, it would have been 51. Yeah, so it was a long time ago. Um, For those watching YouTube who don't know the podcast, um, we've we've been doing this for 10 years, mostly as a podcast. This is episode 394. So, Psycho and Psycho were 50 and 51. Anyway, on on to this week's movie, which is from 2002, Rollerball, concluding, finally, our Rollerball <laughs> two-parter. And, of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary. Sponsored by writers, actors, and directors. When making a movie, for fuck's sake, hire writers, actors, and a director. And also brought to you by multinational corporations. They could never be the bad guys, right? Of course not. Unlike, you know, how many how many science fiction movies? Well, that that's the thing in this version. It's not take, science fiction. We take all the corporatocracy out of the original, and now we move this over to, you know, some other country, and it's some other mm-hmm. problem, and, and it's all those foreigners that are really, you just can't trust, and, and they're dirty dealing and stuff like this. Never would this happen in the U.S., as the original was suggesting. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, we begin with a pretty useless Back to the Future-style uh, luge through the city. It took me about five minutes to remember what that sport was called. Street luge. Yeah. I was Googling like full body skateboarding and whatever, trying to figure out what it was called from my notes. It's street luge. Yeah. So they, you know, right, they, they do this whole elaborate scene, which I guess they were just doing it because it was there. I mean, he was It was bored. the late 90s, early thousands. This is 2000, so it was early thousands. Yeah. That's why they were doing it. And uh, I mean... It was mildly interesting, I guess, but it was uh, it was utterly pointless. <laughs> <laughs> because um, oh, she was, LL Cool J's character saves him from right. the cops. LL Cool J somehow knows where he is in the city, pulls up next to him, you know, and is able to uh, get him to climb into his car and because, then make a getaway. Because he was ta- Chris Klein's character, Jonathan, was taking part in this ir- illegal street losing competition. Illegal uh, street luge. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, uh, LL Cool J uh, makes the pitch for him to join this other sport, rollerball, even though he's got a shot at a real sport in the NHL. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you could just leave all that behind and uh, come Into on another over. country and get the shit beaten out of you yeah. on camera. Where they could change the rules at a at a whim. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, he would have gotten the ship beat out beaten out of him in the NHL too. So that's not very really true. A very either. true. But you're wearing some protective gear there. True. Uh, and you're not on rollerblades. He initially says no uh, until he finds the police looking for him at his place, 
And so he figures he'll he'll take this up to lay low from the law in the U.S. and maybe make some money off the deal. Well, that's where we get mm-hmm. into uh, where where the the original movie they 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 added a few things to the sport, which actually made sense. You know, the, the places to hide the the thing. You it know. made sense, but they were shot so frenetically, you couldn't really follow it. Well, right. And the but rollerball scenes were the only part of the original that I really enjoyed. The concept of actually adding the things to the sport, you know, the, the mm-hmm. hamster yeah. tunnel they and all that very stuff. very American gladiators with it. True, true. But, uh, but I think it was a good idea because it's very realistic. You'd want something to give a chance to people who weren't on a motorcycle, true, you know, a place true. to get away from the motorcycle. Yeah. Um, although in the original they used the motorcycles a lot more well, to to the, get speed. The roller the, the bikes in the original weren't so much, you know, competitive players so much as they were just um there to, to speed everything up. Yeah, you know, everybody kind of hitched on it and that's kind of how they started in the original. Well, eventually, they eventually got used that way. But the in, original used. intention was to just give create speed. And uh yeah, in this one, not as much. But they they have the tunnels and everything to get, and like I said, on paper that makes perfect sense. But the way they portray the game in this movie, it really it, this could have been just Parcheesi. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, the game was really insignificant. It yeah. just happened to be oh, we saw this old movie and there was this game in it, and uh, well, they couldn't even bother to make up a third team. And everything they, was pretty insignificant in this movie. The plot was pretty insignificant in this movie. They play Mongolia twice, like Mongolia, then China, then yeah. Mongolia again. I don't even think there was a championship talking about no. here. They don't even, you never know the scores of the game. They never mention the score once. We don't, I mean, we assume that Jonathan won, but we don't know. Because he's the good guy. <laughs> right. They, they, I mean, so those games happen. In the midst of all that, um, he uh, gets a girlfriend on the team, and um, of course, everything has to be kept, you know, from the uh, from the the boss, owner the, the owner, the the mobsters, and and various other ne'er do wells. Yeah, not well. They're not corporations. They corporate overlords this time. Okay. Yeah, this is now, you know, Kazakhstan mob. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so they took pretty much the message of the original of how, you know, corporations are going to run our lives to uh, distrust of foreigners. Well, get, we'll get to that uh, when you're done with the summary. So, right. There's this other subplot that comes in about the mines and the miners and a, there's a riot involved. But uh, what comes down to at the uh, the final game, um, well, he tries to get his girlfriend traded away uh, to keep her safe and out of this because, of course, the threat is to kill her. Well, he didn't, before that, he left the team. He was trying to run for some That's reason. That's true. I, I missed something there. I don't know why he was trying to run away. He tried to defect. Um, well, because first they... Uh, Somebody gets their their skull pretty much crushed. Oh yeah, the game is very violent. Uh, well, they they figure out that the helmet, the strap of the helmet, was sabotaged mm-hmm. to fall off. Right. And uh, as they're investigating that, then then there's uh you know attempts on a few of their lives. Okay, I'm completely missed any attempt to investigate that. It was brought to the owner, and then I didn't hear notice any mention of it after that. And, uh, yeah, when he realizes that the owner is pretty much in on it, actually, uh, his girlfriend points out to him, played by Rebecca Romaine, uh, she points out that the car- that, that they knew about this in advance because the, the TV cameras weren't on the action. They were on this guy right. 15 seconds before. Right. And so when he figures this out, they start snooping around. And during a game... Um, well, Elvo Cool J's character, I can't remember exactly his name. Ridley? Rid- Ridley? I, I want to say Ridley, but I'm not sure. Uh, when he's almost 
killed, he's on the ambulance, and the first thing he says when he takes off uh, his mask is, we are out of here. <laughs> so that's when they decide they're going to defect. They have the whole sting to get mm-hmm. them out of the hospital. Uh, and, and the night vision scene. Well, the night vision scene is the least of this movie's problems. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean... Uh, that, you know that that might have been okay. I think if it was in, in a surrounded by a better movie, <laughs> if it was given at least some context of somebody watching them with night vision, okay. That's true. That's true. Uh, so yeah, the the defection does not go well, and uh, he is back on the team, and uh, he has to pretend that he's in on this, and he wants a piece of the action, but of course. Um, the, the mobster sees right through this anyway, and he fucks him over by... His one demand was to trade his girlfriend, and he does, but to the team they're playing, the Mongolians, why they're playing them again, I don't know. Uh, maybe there's only three teams in the league. Who knows? And he decided against the NHL for that. <laughs> well, um, so the, the end doesn't just, you know... It's not like the original where everybody's taken out. His team is completely taken out. But the other team decides to get off the ice, or the ice, get off the track. And um, and he's just, you know, skating around with the ball himself. But instead of going for the win, he starts a revolution. <laughs> uh, remember, what was it, the movie Sucker Punch? Mm-hmm. Where they... Uh, they they free themselves through right. dance. Yeah, yeah. He frees himself through a ball. <laughs> <laughs> he frees the entire nation through a ball. He he takes the ball and throws it through the glass and attacks. Then attacks the mob boss who was trying to keep him down. And and if you do want to see some of the worst fight scenes you could ever possibly see. Watch him overpower some dudes with guns. Yeah. With a ball. <laughs> this is the same director. I was going to say this later. Larian uh, Seuss. <laughs> oh, Larian Seuss. Yeah. This is the same director as Die Hard, Last Action Hero, and Predator. Wow. Although, the, go on to some trivia. I'm just going to go to the my, all of okay. my trivia. Although the first draft of the script was considered to, by many to be very good and even superior to the original film, Director John McTiernan decided he didn't like it because it focused more on social commentary while he thought the audience would like to see more of the rollerball scenes. This is why he had the original script completely rewritten several times and made sure it focused more on the WWE-like showmanship, including crazy costumes and stunts. Now, it would have been one thing if they had actually focused on the game. Yeah. But they didn't. Like, just go it, completely absurd with it, be, you know, giant and cotton candy and just give us the big action game scenes. That would have been fine. I could have watched that for an hour and a half. Right. Like the yeah, original, as long as I could follow it. I mean, the original focused on the game very heavily. Mm-hmm. Like, I, it's only a week later and I barely remember the subplots of yeah, that yeah. movie. He was being forced to retire is all he I remember. He was being forced to retire because they were afraid he was getting too big. And he would know. prove that an individual could accomplish something and it was a you know, collectivist society. Right. But what what they did here was they, they, they you know, took the complete message of the original and just motherfucked it. And... <laughs> uh, uh, and then gave us like some snippets of the game. That you know, is some... actually a very appropriate way of putting that, come to think of it. It is, it is. And they just, I mean, we get snippets of the game, we get some costumes, we get the the announcers, uh, but we never actually see the game. Yeah, no, no. Like we see, they, they added sparks to when they score. That's, you know what I mean? And from those opening scenes, you would think that he just went, Full on Joel Schumacher with it. Yeah. Which he kind of did. And like I said, I could deal with that for an hour and a half. It was the the intent, the, the attempt at a plot, I guess. That, that uh. Anyway, LL Cool J admitted in a guest appearance on Conan that the film sucked, but that it was his <laughs> duty to promote it. <laughs> and he's truly the worst actor in this film, which is, I mean, that's saying a lot, actually. Yeah. That is, I mean, that's a 
heavy statement. Based on everything I had heard in Bodo's comment and what have you, a number of reviews, I went into this basically expecting showgirls with but for violence. <laughs> and I was still disappointed. Right. It, well, because, yeah, the, the violence is um, very tame, too. Yeah. And just musically, okay. The original <laughs> opens up with Takata and Fugue in D minor, one of the most amazing pieces of music ever written. This I like one, it a lot, too. <laughs> and in this one, we get pseudo goth industrialish pop. Kind of better with steel drums, though, honestly. Well, yes. Yeah. But it's just, this is everything that was horrible about that time period. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I could think of uh, watching this was, wow, you know. Well, first, I think, I hope Slipknot paid Guar some royalties, at least. Um, oh, and, and honestly, I kind of like, I, mean, I totally get the Guar joke, but I kind of like Slipknot. <laughs> and I'm, I, I think I was most disappointed in them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but this is like a Michael Bay movie without the giant explosions. Right. You Those know. lame little sparks shooting at the out the out the the, uh, the hole when they score, and the <laughs> American announce the American announcer guy. He looked familiar. I couldn't place him. Yeah, I looked that up. He's uh, Paul Heyman from um, one of the wrestling leagues. I think WWE. Oh, okay, okay yeah. that's why he looked familiar. Oh, you got annoying. <laughs> one of the best actors in the film, though I thought, <laughs> which is saying a lot too. And they kick the plot <laughs> off. By attacking the developmentally disabled guy. Oh yeah. Oh, was he the one that that? Yeah, he lost yeah. his helmet. They well, he flipped. They flipped his helmet off. Off because the thing had been cut. Yeah, that attacking the disabled guy kicks the plot off. Yeah. Does that really kick the plot off? Well, Wouldn't one have to have a plot in order for it to fair be kicked point, off? Fair point. That was that's in my notes when I was expecting there to be a plot. And then there's this sudden sex scene because apparently he's shagging one of his teammates, even right. though there is absolutely no context for that. Yeah, well, they're they're keeping it on the down low because they're afraid of the, uh, I guess, the owner from finding out or they'll fuck with them. But there's nothing before that that even tips it. No. No, in fact, the rumor is that uh, she's she's not straight. Well, yeah, yeah. But of course, it's one that he was uh, perpetuating. Of course, to keep his relationship on the deal. But okay, we we need to talk about the night vision scene. <laughs> <laughs> and this scene is infamous. Like this is look up Rollerball two thousand two. You will you see mention of the night vision scene. This is the scene where they're trying to escape the the government or Bob or whoever they are who are pulling their strings. And they're on a bike, uh, Chris Klein and Ella Cool J, And it's all shot in night vision. I read on Wikipedia, I don't know how true this is, that the first time they shot the scene, it was too dark. So they shot it again and then just threw a green filter on it to make it look like night vision. I don't that makes know. sense. But then if that wasn't bad enough, in two times, there are two spots in the scene. One is when the bike crashes through a fence. I forget when the other one was. When we get the classic Hanna Barbera boyoing sound. Yes, the the close caption uh, said strings twang <laughs> to accompany the twang sound. Oh, oh, Wilhelm would have been less out of place in this movie. But yeah, I I think the night vision scenes are the least of this film's problems. Yes, it's just a, a giant what the fuck in the middle of a movie that is made of what the fuck and not in a good way. I mean, the largest what the fuck is Chris Klein's acting. Well, yes, but I saw American Pie back in the 90s. I was expecting that. <sighs> you know, I mean, well, it was an ensemble, so he's okay in that. But this... This is him starring, I mean, 
if you say what you want about Schwarzenegger and Stallone and stuff, and they're <laughs> acting in their well, in their but movies. The difference is, and in fairness, I, we you know Oscar, you know Stallone has done some good stuff. Um, I don't know about Arnie, but they can pull off the action scenes, so it, they've earned it. Yeah. Klein doesn't even the action scenes in this movie are a joke, but you know when you see the lead the lead actors, because our, our LL Cool J and Chris Klein, you know there's a problem because LL Cool J can be interesting and entertaining in a smaller role. You know, I mean, I think uh, yeah, I liked him in Any Given Sunday, of course, mm-hmm. but you don't put him in a lead. Yeah, I'm not sure how that TV show he's on is still on. To tell you the <laughs> truth. <laughs> and I'm just trying to figure out when it went from a silly action movie to a political drama. Oh, right. Because, right, it just talks about what's, I mean, you know, I only knew it was Kazakhstan because I looked stuff up online. They really don't make it clear. Mm-hmm. What I think it's on a map in one scene. I do, it does ring a bell. You're, yeah. Which is why I was for the title, of, you know, the Borat reference mm-hmm. of the. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's like they crowbarred all of that in to give Jonathan some kind of, you know, um, going against the man sort of thing so the audience could get behind him so they could set up the no rules game to mirror Which the original. Didn't even make any sense, the no rules game. They just crowbarred it in to, to have right. some semblance to the original. Because honestly, were there any rules in the first place? Like oh, yeah. the only person I ever saw get penalized for something was the person that took a swing at, at a ref. Right. Well, they literally smashed the disabled guy in the head with the ball. And there were no penalties for no. that. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they, they're deciding there are no rules. They should have just had no rules from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. But we had to have the no rules game because that was a thing in the original. And they were just trying to tie it to the original somehow in terms of the plot. And I kind of liked the the bit where he was going after the mobster until the guns. Yeah. He stops a fucking shotgun with a bar top. Yeah. It's really embarrassing. Like I said, that has to be one of the worst fight scenes. It was that far around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was trauma, but no, not fun. I I don't know what it was. I mean, it was oh, it was worse than a cartoon, you know? Yeah. It was <laughs> Well, cuz cartoon violence aka trauma is fun. Yeah. You know, they know what they have. You just see the bullets kind of spark against the this bar stool, which I mean, whatever it's made of, and then him overpowering everybody with the ball. Yeah. Now you could overpower the first guy with the ball. Sure. But how do you get the second yeah, guy yeah. on the other side of the room with the gun? Right. You know, that's if you're if you're up close and you you've got the element of surprise, that could work. Yeah. On the other side of a room with a guy with a shotgun, no. <laughs> I mean, it's like the movie Hot Shots, then, where they're like, yeah, you know, exactly, exactly. And, you know, they're like really close to the other. Oh no, no, wait a minute! It was UHF where he's doing Rambo and he's just oh, yes, firing away, yes, yes. and then the, the camera pans back and he's like right next to him, but somehow missing. <laughs> and this is the second Norman Jewison film that McTier- McTier- uh, McTiernan has done. The the first being Thomas Crown. I hope Norman Jewison has filed some kind of injunction. <laughs> well, if they remake Moonstruck, would anybody really... Uh... Well, I mean, if you do this with Moonstruck, <laughs> go for it. Chris Klein. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca Romain in the show. Yeah, there we go. Rebecca Romain in the show. Sure. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, well, I'm not even going to talk about sequels and remakes because this is the remake and it should <laughs> never happen again. Yeah. It makes the original look like Chaucer. It does. Yeah. Like, wait, I try to remember what I gave it. I think I gave it a four. You gave it a four. I gave it a three. We both liked it. You liked yeah. it slightly more than I did. Yeah. On the brains to, to show the uh, difference between On the brains. And yeah. I go in zero. There is, there is, this movie does not have any redeeming factors. Wow. 
<laughs> I'm giving it a two. Um, wow. The camera was in focus. Um, <laughs> You're easy. <laughs> well, you know there was there were some uh, like the chases, though unnecessary. You know, actually were were done well, but I mean the, there was nothing connecting them. And really, I think the most egregious offense here is taking what the original was about and just turning it into this xenophobic, yes. bizarre thing that they just melded together. We should have listened to Bodo. Yeah. <laughs> so what have we learned? Uh, that Rebecca Romaine wasn't even the worst actor in the film. <laughs> Like and, I, I just assumed when we started, I said, "Oh, Rebecca mm -hmm. remains in this." Well, you know what we're in for. I wouldn't even put her in the bottom two. Oh no, no, um, the leads were the bottom two. Um, yeah. you, you had to know old Cool J and Chris Klein in lead roles. I mean, she was no uh, Jean Reno or uh, Naveen Andrew, but no, no. You know. but, and I feel the worst for Naveen Andrew. Yeah, because he's a great actor. And he was good in this, actually. Yeah, he was the bright spot. Um, he only had three scenes, unfortunately. Yeah, Jean Reno has. His I could moment. see the beige paycheck hanging out of his back pocket. Yeah, yeah. While he's and, doing it. And, and Jean Reno uh, is, is, is a talented actor. I mean, I love the professional. He's um, easily he bought this a brain, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. but but he's like Liam Neeson. In fact, one of my sp um, suggested titles was um, Jean Reno got to eat. Little nod, the trailer clash there. Their episode, Liam Neeson got to eat because Jean Reno will do anything for a fucking paycheck. Right, definitely. Um, in fact, I wonder how much it would take to get him to come up the show. <laughs> <laughs> we should we should kickstart that. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do a trilogy. Him, uh, Ben Kingsley, and Liam Neeson. <laughs> yeah. And I learned that the late nineties and early thousands were a truly regrettable period in pop culture. Yeah. Yeah, the music really sucked in this from one end to the other, honestly. Just in general, that whole era was just a bad idea. What were we thinking? That was our 70s. Yeah. Yeah, it was. But yeah, white zombie. Mm -hmm. And pop white zombie. Because it wasn't even like, um, was it um, 69? What was that song? <sighs> I mean, nineteen sixty something, nineteen sixty nine. The problem was they were all the same. It was, it was something nineteen something, nineteen sixty nine. Astro Creep and nineteen sixty nine and and whatever. Yeah, they were all the same song. Just a lot of yes. Yes, but they did like a pop version of it at the end of the movie. Yeah, it wasn't even the White Zombie version. It was kind of like a Smashing Pumpkins version of White Zombie. It was really weird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And mercifully, that's it for Rollerball. Until next time, when we'll be concluding our Robert Rodriguez two-parter. There's nothing more zombie take out than interrupting a two-parter with a two-parter. <laughs> right, right. With El Mariachi. Always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you there are. There you are.